Hello, my name is Jodie Brunning from the PSGR, the Physicians and Scientists for Global Responsibility New Zealand, and today I'm talking with Dr. Anna Goodwin. After practicing for decades as a clinical oncologist, Dr. Goodwin now practices in a more integrative way. So she's looking at cancer, she's looking at treatment of cancer, and she's looking at how to stop cancer growing rather than just trying to cure cancer. So that involves a very different conversation. We've just had a previous conversation looking at a lot of the, the science that's involved in the etiology of cancer. And the link to that will be um, below here on the uh, YouTube channel or, or wherever we end up placing it. So, so Dr. Anna Goodwin, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thank you for having me, Jody. It's, it's, it's always a pleasure. It's such a pleasure. So let's let's dig into it because we've already done a lot of the, the, the other science stuff. We'll dig into it. So here's a big, vague question. Inflammation, glycolys glycolysis, oxidative stress, you know, are these the most frequent underpinning drivers? And these can be driven by diet, stress, you know, workplace epigenetics from previous generations. So those three things, inflammation, glycolysis and oxidative stress, would you say they're the most important or is it just because I hear that out in the, out in the. Well, it's, it's yeah. to me, the way I start a consultation and, and the way I, I set up discussions with patients or to say that, you know, to understand cancer as an injury response that's driven by inflammation and more injury signals, the failure of the injury signals to be turned off and an inadequately nourished host. So we have elements of injury, inflammation and malnutrition. And those are the areas that I address and with the understanding that if we address those things, and I've seen this in real time in my own practice, in real life, we can help the patient tolerate their treatment better. They can be ready for their next cycle faster. And what they, does the next cycle then? The next, the next cycle is when their, their mainstream oncologist is going to be giving chemotherapy in, in what's called a cycle. That's usually about every three weeks, sometimes every two weeks, but that's about the most that the body can cope with. That's the time interval in which the chemotherapy or drug therapy is going to be interrupting mitosis of the, the, the cells. And then that gives the, the, the patient a little bit of recovery time. And it takes about that long between treatments for the body to recover. The chemo drugs are most active in the first three to five days, then the body's dealing with the aftermath of the treatment. And that's when we work on detox, that's when we work on really good nutrition to help them recover so that their bone marrow is functioning well. They're making all the white blood cells and all the immune cells that they need. And they're, you know, ready for their next cycle. So um, that's that's kind of the, the way I approach patients that are, are trying to prevent the cancer. But, you know, it's also relevant for people that are on active treatment. And most of my patients, I don't see anybody that doesn't have cancer. Most of them have advanced cancer. Most of them have you know, been told there's nothing else that can be done, or they're scared to death of the treatments that have been offered. And more often than not, I'm able to help them get over their fears, because that's the emotional aspect that really is not dealt with. Our, our medical model is only marginally less scary than the cancer, and sometimes it's more scary than the cancer for some people. And those are the patients that I deal with. And I've always kind of loved the patients that show up with all the Dr. Google questions because I can usually answer those. And, and to me, that tells me that I've got someone that wants to live and they're taking matters in their own hands and I, I can work with that. I don't want to be the one who's beating someone over the head with, you know, you need to change your diet and quit smoking. You know, the, the person's not interested. They're, they're, they don't want to see me. So I, I'm very fortunate in that I, my patients have self-selected to come into my, my fold because they actually want to, to do better and to get information. And, and, it's, and you, know, you understand what the clinical oncologist is, is trying to achieve and trying to do. So what you're, yeah. you're doing is what the clinical oncologist doesn't offer. And right. so you're complementary. You're not fighting. Correct. 
what the correct I can do. dovetail because I've I've seen this in my own practice for five years. I was I was working in actually talking to all the patients that were doing exceptionally well, finding out what they were doing. And I got really interested in, you know, one of my patients who was just one of the most amazing people I've ever met. And she had inquired about the ketogenic diet and we started exploring that together and she implemented that. And she had the whole infusion center motivated whenever she was there with her wonderful keto crackers and she was sharing food and helping people to realize that this is doable and it's fun and having someone like that you know that that can actually motivate people that are feeling so disempowered and to have them see the difference because she was so positive and she actually lived seven years with stage four ovarian cancer she just recently passed, unfortunately, but she's just been one of the most inspirational people I've ever known. And, and that's true of so many people that actually sort of embrace this, this knowledge, because it's, you know, we, we've learned with the diabetes that, you know, we, it, it, I'm, I'm privileged to work with Glenn Davies and the people at Reversal, and, and we, we, we tallied it, we, we've, we've actually reversed 200 cases of type 2 diabetes. People have been able to come off their drugs through diet therapy. If they start eating crap food again and, and stop their lifestyle interventions, they'll be right back where they started from. But the process has been interrupted without drug therapy. And we know that, you know, insulin is one of those things that's conserved. And you, you, you frequently talk about the intergenerational epigenetic signaling that happens. And we know that insulin factors are carried over into three generations. So the, the, the pregnant mom who would have been your grandmother. You were in, you know, your mother was in her womb and you were an ovary in your mother's body as a fetus. And that's the three generations that we see epigenetically changed in response to insulin type signaling pathways. And this is thought to be, you know, a conservative response like for famine, to survive famine. We need insulin to be able to hang on to our calories. And so in periods of famine, this was upregulated. And if someone got pregnant in a famine in order to survive, she needed her insulin upregulated. And then the fetus came and, and all of this was translated into literally three generations of, 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 of people. Yeah. And so they're seeing this for the rodent trial tests with, with pesticides absolutely. and toxic chemicals. And you see the F3 absolutely. generation. Yeah. Three it, generations. And, so the and, and DNA has not changed. It's the, the epigenetic. It's, it's the epigenetic signaling. It's the acetylation. It's the glycation. And we know that the more sugar that's present, the more primitive cells become, the, the cells become glycated. And not only red cells get glycosylated, but, you know, other cells do. And that actually seems to send them towards the more primitive, more inflammatory, you know, metabolically deranged phenotype. So cancer cells basically don't, they sometimes respond, sometimes the, the injury has been oxidative stress, but we know that oxidation is also important to cell autophagy. So we need the balance. And, I and think autophagy is is cell programmed cell autophagy. death, correct? And and so I think our Boolean logic in the the internet age from, has caused us to think is one thing to the other rather than right. It's one different. or other. It's a zero or a one, and and so we're yes, no, yes, no, and it it and and, and in actual fact we need both at various times. Sometimes we need to shut something off. Sometimes we need to do something different. And our body has that wired. And if we just create the good nutritional infrastructure and we have our mitochondrial machinery working just fine, we are able to generate the maximum amount of ATP for one molecule of glucose, which is somewhere around 30 to 32 molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. The mitochondria is like the generator. It, it can either generate energy or heat and it, it's, it's very prone to oxidative stress because it's actually doing combustion. It's a combustion engine generating ATP, which is the energy of the cell. 
and it does that hundreds of times a day, um, it, it, it'll recycle ATP and regenerate it. And, and, and so it, it's quite an amazing little thing. And if you're into evolution, some people think the mitochondria might've come from a bacteria that began a symbiotic relationship with a eukaryotic cell to furnish in energy for the cell. And because it's actually got separate DNA than the, the regular cell. It's quite, it's quite a fascinating little story, but the mitochondria goes through oxidative phosphorylation in the presence of oxygen and then the energy goes through the electron transport chain and and it's quite an elaborate system and all of us were found it very painful in medical school to learn this and we promptly forgot it after the exams but it it's actually one of the most important things we could learn and retain or at least embrace the the concept because the contrast to the oxidative phosphorylation pathway which is the krebs cycle um is anaerobic glycolysis, which occurs in the absence of oxygen. And that process only generates two molecules of ATP. So that's because the cancer cell is embryonic and generally thought, you know, it, it's, it still thinks it's in the uterus. It's not, doesn't have oxygen. So it's only able to get, it's sort of a filter feeder. It's not meant to be there. Everything that's supposed to be in your body has a blood vessel going to it and nervous system going to it. And it can, the nervous, the, the small neurons just transmit various um, adrenaline and various hormones and receptors and all of these things work together. But the cancer being a parasite is, is filtering and all it can rely upon is, is glucose and a little bit of glutamine, but, but the body conserves protein. So I find a lot of people are really getting bogged down with the glutamine and you can't get rid of glutamine. It's not a realistic goal in your diet. So, you know, it's fine to go a little bit plant-based, but you need protein, especially if you're on active treatment. I really don't like it when people get on protein restricted plans, when they're on chemotherapy, they, many, most people have the protein requirements of a burn victim. So that's not the time to be cutting protein calories. And so, but it is a time where you can maximize your good nutrition with good healthy proteins and low glycemic index foods. And if you really want to juice things up, you can do keto fasting or it that my go-to diet, because it's just such, such a good healthy diet is the clean paleo diet, because it basically gets rid of the processed cereal grains. It gets rid of most of the junk. And, you know, it, it's just basically the paleolithic era has been the last 40,000 years. Our genes haven't really changed during that time. So if we actually get back to a diet that our genes understand, they're no longer reacting to our food with an inflammatory cascade. And so it becomes very much an anti-inflammatory way of eating as well. And if we can do a water fast one day a week or a keto fast one or two days a week, it really begins to shift the metabolic signaling in the person's body to the advantage of the person and the disadvantage of the cancer. Because yes. cancer has no capacity to utilize ketone bodies. Ketone bodies are also quite beneficial for brain health. And, you know, Matt Phillips is doing a lot of work looking at um, Alzheimer's as the type three diabetes, because, you know, what we're finding is that the ketone bodies actually are protective to neurons and, and, I did a small study on some glioblastoma patients a few years ago, and, and the ERGO trial has also looked at this. It's increasingly a point of interest to put patients with glioblastoma on ketogenic diets. And you mentioned previously, and, and we didn't have time in our last session to go into the, the aspects of brain cancer, but you know, the, I, I like to put most of my chips on glioblastoma as far as the, 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 the brain tumor of greatest interest because it's important to realize the glial cell 
from whence it's derived is one of those pluripotential stem cells. The glial cell is the only cell that's actually mitotically active in the brain. It's like a transposon. So if a, a new astrocyte is needed, the glial cell says, oh, I can do that. And it's so forms... mitotically active, it's replica It's able to replicate. So it's, it's replicating. So this is why it's the most relevant brain tumor. You know, no one wants to have a brain tumor, end of story. But there are brain tumors that are unlikely to kill you. There are brain tumors that can be removed surgically and cured. Meningiomas, low-grade brain tumors, other things it are you know, there might be 150 different cell types most of them are rare most of them are curable with surgery but glioblastoma is is where we really need to make some progress and the average survival no matter how we slice it is 12 to 14 months with treatment and so and that's if treatment's working and and so i ended up with about 20 patients that had been treated and progressed on everything and we're told they had three months to live. And so I put anyone that was willing to try it on a ketogenic diet. I offered them a Vastin, which was available as a salvage therapy at that time, and perhaps some other effort at chemotherapy. And the average survival on, in that group was eight months. So it was twice what would have been projected in the mainstream setting. If, if I was offering drugs, that would have been viewed as a home run. We've literally doubled the projected survival. Um, one lady who was quite an outlier, I think she had a little bit of an eating disorder. She really went all out with the keto plan. And I got criticized by a colleague who thought she was too thin at the time. And, um, but she actually lived 14 months beyond when she was sent home with a three month prognosis. And she, she did an amazing job with the ketogenic diet, but again, her weight loss be became somewhat of an issue. And, um, and, and then she, she just got sort of tired of the whole thing. And, um, and, and, and to, she, she took an airline trip and, and visited family and, and could not withstand the European pastry temptation. And by the time she came back, things were growing again. Um, and so what it, we, we were saying is that often you end up with patients that have already been undergoing conventional oncology medical treatment. So when you correct. talked about your patients only lasting for months or, or, or you're extending their life, they, that, that becomes extraordinarily important at that late stage. So, you know, this is, you know, for, for someone to turn around and criticise you and say, well, she only made that person last for four months, you need to have it in context of what's happening with the particular stage, the treatment they've gone through, how how their body is and how you can Correct. how much you can actually repair. Correct. And you know it, to to me it's it's just like like Lynn Davies often says, you know, it, it is cancer is just one in more in New Zealand. Yep. One one more metabolic disorder that is can be treated as a metabolic disorder. Yes. And we know that the cachexia problem that we talked about before, the malnutrition, when we're dealing with cachexia, that means the body is basically consuming itself for calories because the cancer has deprived it of nutrition. But if we are depriving the cancer of nutrition through ketogenic principles and feeding the body, you know, I, I like the focus to be more on feeding the body than starving the cancer. Exactly. It's nice when you can do both and the ketogenic model achieves that you're feeding the body and starving the cancer at the same time, which makes it really sexy to me. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so this, and this is quite old. So I did not it's realize been I was around for a hundred years. This has been used to actually control seizures, which are oftentimes from injury to the brain, inflammation to the brain. So we know that the, the ketone bodies actually help stabilize neurons and reduce the inflammation and irritation of the brain. 
to have yes. a calming so, effect. Yes. Yeah. So in 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 1925, Otto Warburg revealed the metabolo metabolism of carcinoma, and so as carcinomas form 90% of cancers, and the metabolism of the carcinoma and the subtypes is related to glucose. You know, it's a as um, Thomas Seafried says, it's it's a ferment fermentation is the way it gets its energy. Correct. That, that's a really it has no oxygen. It has no thing. oxygen. So yeah. that's 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 it's very powerful. It, it's one of the most selective targeted treatments that we could offer our patients, and it's it's actually quite frustrating. When I had my review by the in by the sham reviewer. Um, which it, we discussed in the previous talk. Yeah, we yeah we discussed that, and, and um, you know I was quite criticized for um, discussing ketogenic diets with my patients, and and you know I, my response was that this is the most googled topic on the planet. The number one googled topic that year was the ketogenic diet. It's not like I invented this. This is common knowledge. It's a shame that it's not being more broadly incorporated by the medical field because it is powerful. It is very powerful for the management of cancer in particular. Yes. And so what's really interesting or, or slightly tragic sociologically, as, as we've seen the processed foods transition go through, so it's, it's happened in the wealthier income, then you've seen it in the middle income, and now you're seeing processed food in the low income countries. And so as this has rolled through, you've seen this transition into increased chronic disease. So you've got the metabolic diseases, which include cancer and, um, and diabetes. And it's, just, you know, one of the most simplest things that is, is quite interesting is that, that white rice is associated with diabetes and brown rice isn't. But of course, the white rice was this sophisticated new rice that we polished rice is to be called. Yeah. Yeah. And so... You know, these these modern technologies can take the goodness and the fiber and the nourishment out. And so we see the cancer increasing. So the predicted cancer is it's predicted to increase in low income countries. And this is, you know, the, the parallels and the associations with the increasing diets of ultra processed food has, has exactly played right. a, a massive role because a, a huge proportion of these processed foods involve refined carbohydrates. Absolutely. And the brown rice example is so simple. I mean, you it, it will take you out of ketosis to have brown rice, but it, you will not get the insulin overshoot that you get from most complex, from most refined carbohydrates, because as you mentioned, you have the fiber, you also have the riboflavin. So, but white rice is almost nutritionally bankrupt. It, it, it does cause insulin overshoot. And it's important to avoid that insulin overshoot because that's when we start stockpiling glucose in the liver and and through glycogen production and and then we we're off to the races because once you get a, a big insulin spike your sugar goes down and then you're hungry again so you're on the the hypoglycemic roller coaster and the key to that is not more sugar it's to eliminate sugar and get slow release fuel either through protein fats or complex carbs that actually have fiber and more nutritional value. And that usually will smooth out people's insulin spikes. And insulin is quite important because as I mentioned, it's a, it's a growth conservation molecule. So a lot of the, more of the cancer growth signals, AKT3, which they're starting to look at as a, another target that they could look at. They wanna look at hexokinase 2, which is part of the gluconeogenesis pathway or the, 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 the glycolysis pathway. They want to inhibit these molecules instead of just going, well, why don't we just cut back on the sugar? Um, yeah. What a concept. Now, we want a targeted thing that we can charge the taxpayers $10,000 a month for, for the desperately ill cancer patient, and we won't tell them about their diet. It makes no sense. It makes yes. absolutely no sense as a, so, as a social paradigm. So in policy, we can talk about sugar-sweetened beverages, but we can't talk about processed or ultra-processed food. And so you'll see in New Zealand's food policy, there's no discussion about processed food. There's, there's a little bit of a discussion about processed meat because, because the evidence of, of the association of cancer with um, processed meats with the nitrates in it is, is very 
clear um but they're not they're talking about biscuits but they're not talking about huge the noodle the, the noodles and the crackers and the, this and then that and and then even just your bread that is a low quality bread that, that's got lots of numbers in that you don't know that's a pro ultra processed food and, and fizzy drinks the price never goes up we want to make fizzy drinks available for everyone it's outside it's a, it's completely outside the narrative of what is health in the in the our government agencies and our health agencies so it we, you know we're, we're going to try not to talk about politics too much and i probably shouldn't but um but so so what i want to go now and talk and deviate to is the enzyme cofactors because these are you know th these this processed food is nutritionally deficient deficient can you tell me about the enzyme cofactors and the way they work in the molecular pathways with cancer and preventing cancer. well it's 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 a well beyond the, the scope of just sort of an overview, um, magnesium, for instance, is a cofactor for over 300 different enzymes. And relevant to our discussion, it's a cofactor for many of the kinases, which add phosphate, a phosphorus group, which is important for energy metabolism. We know that almost everyone with metabolic illness is low in magnesium. Magnesium is mostly tissue-based, so it's intracellular. It doesn't, you know, serum levels correlate miserably with actual tissue levels. And so I don't go checking magnesium levels on my patients. It's a waste of time. And the what's what oftentimes happens is when a problem is quite common, the normative values get shifted lower. Like when you have B12, which is a very common deficiency in New Zealand because of the glyphosate issue, which is an, as an antibiotic, it has diminished the conjugating bacteria in the gut, which basically conjugate um, tryptophan and phenylalanine to form B12. We've lost those bacteria because and of I the would, glyphosate. I would argue that um, actually ultra processed diets have shown it, a, a, a processed, ultra processed food diet, which is a conventional diet that many young people are on. Um, in seven years, the microbiome is degraded. So it's it's Correct. not just yeah. the glyphosate. It's not just the glyphosate. That's right. It's the 2,4-D. It's the yes. glufosinate. It's the 10 other chemicals but that, that the deranged. The, the, yeah, that's exactly right. So we're not picking on just the one, but in any case, the normative levels of B12 were, you know, healthy level is 400 or above. Our normative level here is, you know, somewhere around 150. So people are, it used to be that deficiency was defined as anything less than 200, but because almost everyone that you check out of 100 people is going to be below 200. So we've changed, we, we've made 180 normal now. And so you can imagine the health impact of that because B12 is essential for energy function, brain function, nerve, neurological function. And it's also one of the important methylating, um, co methylating cofactors that actually silences or helps with gene expression because it's those methyl groups around the outside of the cell that are so important for epigenetic signaling. So, you know, if we've, you know, unmethylated a promoter that now is open for the, the reading frame to be transcribed with the next generation of cells, we've, we've integrated a promoter sequence where we didn't really want it. Um, we didn't really want that to be, uh, you know, expressed, but here we go. It's just one of those hits that Which results in more of the, Malignant production. Phenotype. Correct. We've we've taken the cell to a, a less stable place, and and so um, and, and we look at manganese. Manganese is vital for the um, the mitochondrial function, but it you, you can't have too much or too little. The body wants it just right. You know, you you can get toxic either way. Zinc is also vital for the oxidative bursting for our immune system for mitochondrial function so many of these pathways and and so many of these herbicides and pesticides serve as chelators and so when we have the processed diet these minerals if they were in our food to start with they're bound up to something in our food stuff 
making them unavailable to be absorbed or so to be incorporated. A, essentially, it attracts. So you'll, you'll right, get... It attracts. You've, you've formed a salt. And it with, binds with, and it becomes... It stops being bioavailable when it's... It's, it's no longer bioavailable. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. And, and so th there's really a, a, a double whammy. There's so many things to unpack about what we have done with our diet for the last few decades. And it just seems to be the aspirational goal seems to be to allow things to just develop in an uncontrolled fashion um, for, for the sake of industry patents. And, and, and this is where it's I think we, not to we think both. Like that. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so these things, you know, you must have adequate selenium for DNA repair. It's vital for glutathione peroxidase for, all of the glutathione recycling in the liver requires selenium. Um, and, and we just need all of these things. We must have them, but it's a narrow therapeutic window. You don't want to take mega doses of selenium because that can be toxic. You can take mega doses of vitamin C, but you don't need it all the time because what happens when you take mega doses of anything is a process called tachyphylaxis. And what happens with vitamin C all the time is you reduce your vitamin C receptors. So then you're getting worse trough yeah. levels because yes. vitamin C has a very short half-life in the body of about four to eight hours. And the key is when you get that vitamin C in your body, you want it going where it needs to go. And so you need more alpha lipoic acid so that you get proper uptake into the mitochondria. You want to go exercise gently after your intravenous vitamin C so that your muscles are taking it up. You're getting it into your system so it's not going straight into the toilet. So they have actually shown that trough levels of vitamin C in people that are getting ultra mega doses all the time, they, they have very low trough levels. So then they almost have to rehabilitate themselves and and allow an upregulatory response to get their vitamin C receptors normal again. Uh, the body wants balance. It's not going to allow you to sit in this absurd level of vitamin C for very long. So it, it can be a powerful tool, but it needs to be used judiciously and appropriately with a, a defined endpoint and a beginning and in the right context. We That's still need good studies to show, you know, does it interact with chemotherapy? If it does, you know, how? You know, some people have been very brave outside of New Zealand and have studied this with various chemotherapy um, agents. And it actually seems to potentiate the killing effects of chemotherapy. And that would be mm -hmm. anticipated because those higher levels are providing a peroxide ion that's actually increasing the oxidative stress on the cell. So it would be anticipated that you would see more autophagy in that, in that setting. And, and, but oncologists are very frightened. They think we're going to be reducing the, the, the free radical um, chain of events that's meant to happen. And that's most, most chemotherapy drugs work through the generation of free radicals by some way, shape or form. Right. And that's true of radiation therapy. You know, we are not successful with radiation in the absence of oxidative radicals. We must have some oxygen. So, you know, typically if someone's got a low hemoglobin, we'll transfuse them so that they can get adequate tissue oxygenation to allow the radiation therapy to work. So, you know, there's a lot of these things that, that, you know, if you, if you just go, you know, read how to starve cancer or any other the, the books, you, you can, you can go, sideways so easily because these shotgun approaches are not very effective for the individual yes. and and there are certain nuances to each tumor you know and, and some of these these approaches involve long-term use of antibiotics which is not really good for people with gut cancers they need a functioning microbiome for people that are on immune checkpoint inhibitors they need they must have a functioning microbiome particularly for acromantia species for their expensive immune checkpoint inhibitor to work. They're paying $7,500 a whack for a drug that's not gonna work if they don't have a functioning microbiome, particularly with butyrate forming species. Oh, that's fascinating. And and we were talking about ultra processed food and how such a large proportion of the diet involves unwittingly often its habit. But then you talk about 
manganese and magnesium and selenium. And so you always, you've always been very strong. The reason you have to change your diet and start eating, you know, dark leafy greens and colored vegetables and good quality grass fed meat is because that's, and, and nuts and seeds, because that is where those nutrients are. And then you get that's a right. wider range of bioavailable nutrients that will support your immune system and reduce inflammation. That's right. And we can't get it all in a bottle. You know, food was made to be eaten whole. And there are foods that are more active when they're lightly cooked. Um, you know, the raw foods are not going to agree with many people. Many people have simply lost the digestive machinery to um, assimilate that because of the fiber content, particularly your crucifers and asparagus are, are much more assimilated when they're lightly cooked. And, and so uh, my first go-to is diet. And then we, I, I'm usually simplifying people's supplements because some people end up on, you know, thousands of dollars of supplements per month and they, and people get pill fatigue. So the patients I see, I'm seeing the people that have been to see, you know, two or three oncologists, and they're also seeing an integrative person and uh, various, you know, natural health people. And they, they come to me with this insane number of supplements and, you know, and, and, and it, it just, it, it's too much for most people. And you can just see it in their eyes that, is this my life? And, and, and people don't want to live taking pills forevermore. I would say that, you know, a few supplements, because we can't vouch for some of our vegetables and the soil they were grown in. We don't know exactly how much nutrients are are being delivered but at the same time food is the first foundation and and you know it's, I think it's so important for people to get comfortable in their kitchen or have someone in their family that that is comfortable just going in there making a simple meal that's balanced and full of good fats good protein low glycemic vegetables and you know I, I've basically been on the diet I recommend for my patients for the last seven or eight years and it's easy and you know I, I just get people making simple meals and, and their health just improves. It's, it's, it's just a very easy thing to do. I can make a meal faster than they can go to KFC. The increasing literature on the addictive uh, potential of ultra processed food is growing stronger and stronger. Absolutely. So if, Absolutely. You, if you search this up, you'll find that it's about 12 to 14% of people have the same ad addictive responses that sort of reflect are similar to the patterns that you see in for example an alcoholic or a drug addict absolutely so people changing and of course you you, you can for food actually re reducing that addictive response doesn't actually take that long but it, it will lead to people pro procrastinating but they don't and and this is something oncologists aren't going to talk about so you know, is the is moving away from something that you you love because you actually have a massive addictive response is is there and that evidence is in the literature. So if you look at the white, the simple white carbs, white sugar, white rice, um, and what and wheat, um, and you look at the addictive response for that, you are for, so for example in your prostate patients, you see a repeated pattern. What is that repeated pattern? Oh, I I I. I... I shudder to say, but it, but it, it actually is so just in our faces in this country and, and association does not mean causation, but I cannot help but think that there's some relationship between wheat based carbs, dairy and prostate cancer here. I I've, spoken to literally hundreds of men with prostate cancer the last 10 years. And they all tell me the same thing about what they have for breakfast. I always ask my patients what they eat. And, and in New Zealand, I think it's so fixable because people here are, are, are very smart about food. They, they know what a sensible eating plan is. They've been told that they must have wheat bix for their bowel health. They've been told that this is an essential component for fiber. And so they all were trying to be good. This is what, what the dietary association and standard care is have your 
your cereal for the breakfast, your low, cereal it's low you fat, mean. you know, high fiber, it's great. But, you know, most of the things that cause our cancers are the, the, the repetitive day in, day out things, apart from things like Hiroshima or Chernobyl or these isolated events, it's the chronicity of what we're telling our body. And that, that includes causes occupational, that includes occupational Absolutely. exposures. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's the day in, day out boring things that over a decade lead to the bioaccumulative toxicities, the mutagenesis and the loss of proper gene expression and signaling that puts someone in the, in the, at risk of cancer. And, and, you know, every man I've seen with prostate cancer for 10 years eats wheat mix and milk for breakfast and has a piece of toast with it and a sandwich or two for lunch. So we have an average of four slices of bread and wheat mix and milk. And men, I will say this categorically, and there is published literature, I was criticized for this by the sham reviewer as well, but men do not need milk. I would rather a man drink a glass of beer than to have a glass of milk. Milk is the worst possible thing for the prostate. It has estrogens, growth factors, and IGF-1, all of which are prostate cancer growth signals. And it's, it's just, it's a cocktail for prostate cancer. I would, I would go as far as to say that. We don't, we're the only species that nurses from another species, not our own. And, and every one of us, and, and I'm not picking on dairy farmers, milk is a perfect food in many respects. You know, it, it's helpful for children, for growth. It's not as harmful for women because our bodies are adept at dealing with estrogens. Our bodies love estrogens, but men who are 50 or above have more estrogen in their body than their wives if their wives are the same age. And because our estrogens are going down, theirs are going up, especially as they get belly fat. So as a man's adiposity increases, he's making these biogenically active estrogens. And I would argue that this is the real reason for prostate cancer. This, we don't see prostate cancer in young men who have high testosterone and low estrogen and high lean body mass. It's unheard of. We don't see prostate cancer in that population. When we mm -hmm. see it is when men are getting more adiposity. And we know that that's directly related to metabolic syndrome. They're getting all of these chronic illnesses. Their belly fat is associated with higher risk of cardiovascular mortality. And if they live through that, then prostate cancer is waiting for them if they don't actually change diet and lifestyle yeah, and habits. And it's and they they look estrogenic, and I've seen the same in in people that have grown up in families of sprayers, where they've grown up in proxy proximity yeah. to horticultural regions. So that it's the thinning, the softer hair, the, the softer yeah. skin, the thinner skin. It's all you know. It's and this is just this is a this, because it's the term xeno hormones. So That's whatever right. they're being exposed to, whether it's dairy or pesticides. Yeah. It's acting in that estrogenic, xeno estrogen. It's a xeno -estrogen. That's correct. That's correct. And so you lose your methylation pathways because the way estrogen gets out of your body is through methylation. You can check all these B12 levels. They're all going to be under 200, 100%. So they can't methylate these estrogens to get them out of their bodies. And so it, you know, I, we have potential causality here in addition to the the association factors. And so, you know, what I find is, you know, I step into the secondary prevention role. And so I see these men that have gone through a great intensive treatment to get rid of their prostate cancer. And some, and we monitor their PSA and sometimes we, we will see a PSA rise and then we start to panic. The man's starting to panic. He's seeing his life pass before his eyes. And when we make dietary changes there, so often I'll see the PSA just settle down. My, my ex-brother-in-law, his PSA went up to 12. He scared himself to death. He'd lost his beard and he had the belly and he was eating his, 
you know, bowls of ice cream and his cereal with milk every morning for breakfast. And, and I said, you just have to get off that. Stop those things. Eat fine. Satisfy your hunger. The whole thing is, is you know, if people are hungry, they will not stay on any diet. And it's important to realize hunger comes about from insulin. So the more we can tame our insulin, the less battle we have with our hunger. And then suddenly it's easier to stay on any sort of diet. Well, happy story. He ended up, his PSA went down to three after three months of being on a lower carb diet and getting off of his milk and ice cream. And I wouldn't say the same about cheese or, you know, yogurt and kefir. Those are healthy products. It's the fermentation of dairy reduces and denatures the xenoestrogens. Yeah. So fermentation is fine and, and, and you can enjoy your cheese and your, your yogurt, but you know, off the milk, milk is directly yeah. out of the cow udder and ice cream is concentrated cream plus sugar or high fructose corn syrup. So you're getting mm -hmm. your IGF-1 elevated. They did a study a few years ago and I think it's disappeared, but one bowl of ice cream contains the annual amount of dioxin that the EPA once recommended. One bowl. Well, and that's see the American ice, ice cream. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but but that was 10 years ago. So because it's a ubiquitous environmental poison, I'm sure the levels have gone up. The ambient levels have gone up. and But dioxins and all these things are concentrated in the cream fraction, which that's one of the only things I struggle with. If you're going to if you're going to have cream, buy organic cream, because a lot of the xenoestrogens are concentrated in the fat fraction of the milk. I, yeah, I hate hearing. I, I am so aware because chemicals are lipophilic. They love, you know, they, they do yeah. attract into the fats. That's the I, only downside. But And, and I do see a I lot of cream on the, on the keto. Yeah. I do too. I love my butter. But, you know, I could promote Lewis Road Creamery butter. I, I could be their spokesperson. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. um, go ahead you're not going to see clinical trials. So clinical trials are very expensive. They take years to develop and then to, um, to, to carry through um, because you can't just isolate these different nutrients. And no, clinical can't. trials are the in, uh, incentivized by pharmaceutical corporations because they're gonna, they've got the IP at the end. They're going to make a lot of money once the trial is That's over, right. theoretically. So what you, what, what is powerful when you when you start looking at the science and the evidence is that N equal one, the people that have their stories and the observational studies in the scientific literature, and then you start getting a mass of observational studies and then they do a meta-analysis. And so this is the evidence you can follow. And I, I actually, Dr. Asim Malhotra is very good at talking about the evidence pyramid mm. um, for, for, for really good food and moving away from ultra processed food for heart health. I'm going to just consider that maybe there's a lot more oncologists looking at vitamin D levels. I know over COVID in New Zealand, the prescriptions of vitamin D actually increased. So I believe there's a lot more knowledge about vitamin D out there, but I'd love you to talk about vitamin D with respect to cancer, please. Well, it's, it's important to realize that vitamin D is a, a, a regulator of over a thousand different genes. We are hardwired in our biology to respond to sunlight. So in, in one of my previous discussions at, uh, at AMA or ACNAM, um, you know, I talked about the two things that we must have after a cancer diagnosis. If we don't fix those things, I, I just don't see good results. And, and that's fixing vitamin D and fixing B12. And it, and it makes sense from a, an, an evolutionary biology standpoint, because if you are not getting any vitamin D as a paleolithic person, it, that means that you've gone to your cave and life isn't very good for you. And so your systems begin to shut down, your brain health goes, your cardiovascular health goes, and of course you're much more prone to cancer and inflammation. Um, the vitamin D like I said, it's, it's very important for e adherent expression, and it also helps to regulate immune function. You know, we don't want our immune system to be 
haywire and reacting to things it doesn't need to react to. The vitamin D seems to regulate that, bring everything back to center, rebalance. All of those things seem to happen. And it's vital for our resistance to tuberculosis and certain key bacteria that are hard to get rid of. And, and so it's, it's, it's absolutely essential for good health and in particular health related to cancer. And if your B12 goes down, that you're basically telling your cells that you're too feeble to hunt. So when the body gets those two signals, it's like, oh, she's bad off. She's gone to her cave and she hasn't eaten meat in weeks. She's all washed up. So everything starts to turn to crap. But I find that if we fix those things, the body might say, you know, I thought she was washed up, but she's out of her cave and she's still hunting. So let's give it a go. I think that's what, the, I think those are the conversations the cells might be having because it just, it just kind of makes sense that that's how, how we would be made because why would we want to be living in our cave and, and not having good, good food? Um, and, and so I, I think that's, that, that was kind of how, how it might have, have worked to, to conserve our lives, but also to allow us a way out when our lives no longer held meaning. Exactly. And, 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 um, and, and talking about vitamin D, so, you know, in the literature, you know, in the literature, it's fairly evident that you are prevented from lower respiratory tract infections, such as absolutely. Um, um, pneumonia, if your level is above 50, but, absolutely. There, but specialists are now saying, I believe over 75 nanomole in the blood is, um, is healing and pr protective. And there was an interview that I saw recently with a very highly respected uh, cancer doctor in the UK. And he said he sees the best results in his patients when it's over 100. What I agree with that. I totally agree. Really? It's very hard to get a vitamin D level here. Patients have to pay. It was $40. And now it's, I think the price has even, mm. has even gone up to get it tested. And you're absolutely discouraged from getting a vitamin D level. And if yeah. you don't write on the lab form, patient will pay. It will be sent back to you with a, not, with a lecture saying you're a naughty doctor yeah. and you shouldn't order these things unless you think someone has osteomalacia or something. And, and so most of our levels here in New Zealand, because we've been scared out of the sun, most people, especially in winter, are running around with a level of about 20. And, and so this is incompatible with good health. And of course, Maori are even more at risk. Our, our government wrings its hands constantly about disparities in health. But I've been prattling on about vitamin D for years now. And, they and the literature, don't want the to, evidence in the literature is very The literature is there. We know um, American blacks in Michigan in the winter because the pigment of the skin filters the sunlight. So a, a, a darker skinned person needs more time in the sunlight to achieve the same vitamin D levels of, of a lighter skinned person. So, you know, they, they studied vitamin D levels in blacks in Michigan. Their levels got down to 10. Yes, I mean, it, it's insane. And no wonder they're not well. No wonder they are more susceptible to COVID-related deaths and, yeah. and, and flu-related deaths and heart disease and all the things that plague people that, you know, are in an ethnic minority. And vitamin this D would be the first hormone. place to start if someone yeah. actually sincerely wanted to bridge the gap in, in healthcare and fix disparities. I don't want to talk to anyone unless they are willing to actually do these studies and measure because they, they start out with these itsy doses of vitamin D, yeah. like 200 international units, and then marvel that it had no effect on the cohort of patients. And, and that study was actually done. I'm like, that was a complete waste of time. I mean, it's, it's so precious to be able yeah. to get funding for nutrition. And when you blow it on something stupid and, and a non-relevant dose of vitamin D, you know, a fair skinned person, for instance, will make about 10,000 units of vitamin D in about 20 minutes in the sun. A, a darker skinned person will need two or three hours to make that same amount. Yes. And, so and, and it's not even feasible when you're wearing clothes and then we'll all get in trouble if we take our clothes off and go in the sun. So I think it's inevitable that we have to have a real discussion. If we're going to address healthcare disparities, we must address it with vitamin D supplementation yeah. in this country because we have a melanoma 
problem. We have skin cancer problem. We are not hot, hardwired for a sun that's unfiltered by any ozone layer. We've got the big ozone hole here in Australasia. And so realistically, I think the only way around this problem is supplementation. Vitamin D deficiency is directly related to lymphoma, colorectal cancer, um, lower levels are associated with worse outcomes in lung cancer. All of these studies are out there in the literature. There's plenty of compelling evidence to justify using vitamin D supplementation for cancer patients. Absolutely. And so in New Zealand, the only policy association for vitamin D is for musculoskeletal conditions and for pregnant women. So when doctors say, I want to prescribe vitamin D, it's almost like they're going against policy. So that's why they get questioned. And we find that the Ministry of Health is so is decades behind the evidence in the fine, in, in, in the scientific yeah. literature. It, and it's, and it's that pathetic. for it, all the rhetoric on, on et- equity, it's it's actually letting letting our low income people down because people with a little bit more pocket money are going to walk straight into the naturopath and and buy their vitamin yep. d whereas these people can afford it. Yep. so this is a discussion that's not being ha- had and it is it is political and it's political because they, they refuse to look at the sort of science that that is a as a broad breadth it's the it's the it's the N equals one, it's the the open literature and actually having an honest appraisal. Um, I can't, I know we're, we're, we're coming to the end. Is there anything that you would like to, to add before we, we finish our discussion today? Oh, no, it's, it's just always such a privilege to, to be able to share information that people can put to use in their lives to prevent cancer, to feel better, to promote health and you know, and, and, and I would never want anyone to, to not get needed treatment. And I still re- reinforce the recommendations of my colleagues when someone has a high risk malignancy and, and they've been recommended for chemotherapy. And, you know, there is still a role for that, both, you know, in the post-operative setting, sometimes in the pre-operative setting, like I was saying, to shrink the cancer, make a, a better surgery possible. Um, radiation has very, you know, very good role to play in terms of pain relief in the palliative setting and also cures a lot of cancers that are found early and can salvage patients who might have a localized recurrence. And so there's very much a role for all of these modalities together. And what I want to see in the future is the way to integrate them into one coherent medical paradigm so that patients don't feel like they've got a warring set of doctors that don't understand each other and don't talk to each other. One of the saddest things I've seen was when I attended a a conference in Melbourne and I was invited to speak to, to a group of integrative practitioners. And I asked them how many of them had a relationship with their oncologist where they could call and talk about a patient and only one person out of 200 raised their hand. And I think this is such a missed opportunity to you need those actually, feedback loops. actually help people. Hostile. And it, it helps the patient because patients are actually, they feel secretive. They're afraid to see me because they don't want to make their oncologist mad. And I've had dinner with their oncologist and I know these people. And, and I, and, but, but, you know, to see the struggles that patients have to even get the care that, that they know that they need, it, it, it seems, it seems a real shame. In this particular talk, we've really focused on food and nutrition, but you emphasize all the time that that healing so we don't we're not cured we're, we're healed and that's spiritual and emotional so we can have trauma we can have you know stress and that promotes the information so it's not just food and diet that is part it's not of just food and diet we are multi-dimensional beings we are we are energy and we are mass that's contemplated by einstein's theory that's not airy fairy that's that's foundational physics and um everyone knows E equals MC squared. So that means we exist in a continuum of mass and energy and the energetic aspects of healing cannot be overemphasized. And it's important to realize that fear deprives people of, of, of that 
energy that they need to heal. And what I find so often is, is healing begins when people are no longer afraid of dying. They're no longer afraid of their cancer. They can actually be healed. And sometimes their cancer just stops growing. So people can actually coexist with their cancer. I don't like using the word cure because as a purist, cure means that we've eradicated every last potentially malignant cell in your body. And from our understanding of how this works with the dandelion effect, et cetera, that's, that's a very tall order. So I think cure creates false expectations and it also shifts the patient's awareness away from their own ability to keep maintaining their healing and maintaining those good habits that they might've started when they were more afraid. It's important, let your fear transform you into taking care of yourself nourishing and let, yourself and, and then the you let love. go of the fear and then live your life to the fullest to your and live your best life that's it and that's there's purpose that's purpose isn't it so yeah, absolutely. I think a beautiful way to end thank, thank you, you very much for your time and i look forward to meeting with you again thank you